I want to say to uh, Tyler again, thank you for letting me come. Um, and thanks for saying yes to Cartersville. Uh, we had uh, uh, done the studies, uh, you know, the demographic studies and whatnot in Bartow County in this area uh, was growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, and so we had had it on our list of targeted cities to plant a healthy, thriving uh, church. And, uh, and so when we had that conversation, I just said, have you thought about Cartersville? Well, apparently the Lord had thought about it. Uh, and said it to, uh, uh, to Tyler. And so here we are at Awaken Church. And I just want to tell you, this is a great church. This is a great church. Amen. Amen. And you, and you may be asking, well, well, why do you say that, Pastor John? Look, my job for the last 30 years, I have worked with the church. Um, I, have, um, I was actually, uh, like, literally born into the church. I got saved when I was 10 years old at a kid's camp in 19, none of your business. And... Um, <laughs> And I've been in been it since, okay? I know churches, and, of course, I, I work in the denominational offices, so I understand what healthy churches look like. Let me tell you why this is a great church. Because the people that I see are happy to be here. They're happy to be here. They're, they're smiling. They're hugging necks. They're high-fiving. They're fist-bumping. They're, they're, and there's a great spirit in the room. And I can tell you this for someone who deals with, with churches on a daily basis. There are a lot of churches out there that the people come because they feel like they have to and they're not happy to be there. And you know which ones I'm talking about. You come in, they're, 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 they look depressed. You know, they look like they somebody stole their Fruit Loops that morning, and it's like I love Jesus and I'm mad about it. You know what I'm talking about? And so, and so, I have those. As a matter of fact, I've closed eleven of those in the last year uh, of churches. I've closed eleven, and I was elected in April of 2022. Uh, yeah, 22 um, as the superintendent, and uh, I've closed eleven churches in a little over a year. Uh, we're the fastest shrinking district in the nation. Um, but, listen, the truth is, I, I'm just doing the paperwork on them. They died a decade ago. Somewhere along the line, somebody decided that they didn't want to change. They didn't want to reach their community with the gospel, and so it was us four and no more. And so I had the, the glorious luxury of coming in and just doing the paperwork and disposing of the property. But you look like you're happy to be here today. And so I'm going to prepare you, even though I am the district superintendent, that phrase, that, that title makes people nervous because he's like, oh, he's the denominational guy. Look, I am normal. I'm as normal as you come. As a matter of fact, I asked Tyler what the dress code was today, and he's like, you know, whatever, I'll draw the line at a tank top, but other than that, we're good. And so I was kind of hoping I could wear shorts and flip-flops, and I can't uh, because I'm the superintendent and there are expectations. However, I am incredibly normal. You think that the district office, we like float down the hallways and have coffee with angels in the break room. No. We have problems just like everybody else, okay? We have bad days. I want to share a little bit with you today. I want to tell you a story. We're going to cover a few points, and then I'm just going to pray for you. I have one redeeming quality as a guest speaker, and that is I am short-winded. I do not preach a long time. I don't feel like you got to hear from me for an hour, even though Tyler told me I could preach as long as I wanted to. But I just I feel that that's abuse. And so uh, I don't even have that much to say in an hour. Uh, any introverts in here? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, good. All right. I'm a for. I am a forced extrovert. I have to do it. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to tell you a story and whatnot. A little bit about me. Uh, married uh, Jennifer. Uh, couldn't be with me today. She sends her regards. I have three daughters, so I haven't won an argument since 2005. Um, they block vote against you, men. Am I right? Anybody? Yes, they do. They block vote against you. And so I haven't won an argument, uh, but I am the number one guy in the house. Uh, every, well, I have a dog, but he's been neutered, so he's no good. But, uh, but I'm the number one guy in the house, and everybody loves Dad, okay? All the ladies want to take care of Dad, so it is a good life. Um, I've got one that just got married in April, another one just graduated uh, college, going to law school, and another one just graduated high school. And so we are on the cusp of, uh, like, empty nesting. Uh, for the first time ever, and so pray for me, uh, so that I'll know what to do with my time, um, and so, yeah, because, you know, right now, I just take care of all the ladies, uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I started ministry in 1991 as the summer youth intern uh, at Parkway Assembly of God in Macon, uh, we did nine years on the farm mission field. Uh, we lived in Jerusalem uh, and worked primarily with Palestinian Muslims in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, planted a couple of churches, ran a Christian school there, planted a second Christian school uh, over in Bethlehem, uh, and uh, we came back to the United States. God called us back uh, home, 
Uh, I became the state youth director, the district youth director in 2011. Uh, was that for nine years. Um, became the director of church resourcing. I don't know if you remember Brother Tim that came and spoke here. Uh, t- I was that office before Tim was. I became the secretary treasurer, which is the worst job in the Assemblies of God uh, because you deal with numbers and bylaws and rules and regulations and ministerial stuff, and that was boring and terrible. And so I'm like, Jesus, I will do it as long as you ask me to, but when you say I don't have to, I want. Bless the Lord, I was elected as the superintendent in 22, so I got the fun job again. Uh, The youth job was actually the funnest job in the Assemblies of God because you have all the fun and zero responsibilities. Um, And so (laughs) now I have to be an adult, and uh, and, and I'm responsible for a lot. So I've been in the denominational thing for about 13 years now, a little over uh, 13 years, and uh, uh, I've had the luxury of just going and and visiting churches and seeing young ministers ministers walk into uh, their calling like Tyler and see God bless them in incredible ways. Uh, And so I'm happy to be here today. I want to tell you a story, and then we're going to jump right in uh, to the scripture uh, that I have prepared this morning. Um, It was was a Saturday morning in August of 1997. I'm in Jerusalem, and the school year is starting on September the 1st. We ordered our school books from the United States. It was an English-language school. We had about 500 kids uh, from K through 12. Uh, you ask, why would, why would parents in East Jerusalem and the Arab community and the international community want to send their kids to an English-speaking school? Well, of course, everybody wants to live in America. I know we've got problems, but I'm going to tell you, I've been all around the world. Everybody wants to live in America, and they want to be native English speakers. And so we had a great school uh, going there and a great ministry because we, were allowed, we preached the gospel. They had Bible classes they took and preached the gospel every day. We did after-school Bible studies, and we had an incredible ministry going on. Uh, Well, school was starting on September the 1st. I had no school books. They were stuck in customs up in Haifa. We had to to ship them by boat uh, uh, from the United States. And I had finally gotten the word that they were going to be let out of customs. And I had to hire a Jewish truck driver, a big flatbed. It was about two tons worth of books uh, to be delivered from Haifa down to Jerusalem. And so my StarTac cell phone rang on that Saturday morning. Uh, anybody remember Star Tax? Okay, for all the kids in here, it had like a little antenna that you had to pull out, and you flipped it open. It was awesome. Okay, you think I'm a dinosaur, don't you? And so my little Star Tax rang, and, uh, and it was the Jewish truck driver, and he was telling me, "I'm not going to bring your books to your Arab neighborhood." You guys know the tension between the two communities, the Arabs and the Jews, and and whatnot. Safety concerns. It's reasonable. I understood it. Uh, not an issue. But it was two tons of books, and the automobile I drove was a Fiat Uno. Uno means one, which is the lowest number. You can't get lower than one when it, when it comes to a Fiat. It was this tiny little subcompact car. It had four doors. I don't know why, but uh, but uh, there's no way I was getting two tons of books in my Fiat Uno to get from uh, from the other side of Jerusalem over to my school. So I began to negotiate with him in my Middle Eastern negotiating skills. If you've never been to the Middle East, it's very loud. People yell a lot, okay? It's not emotion. It's just the way they communicate. And so I began to communicate on the phone, look, man, you're going to kill me, bro. I didn't say that. But, uh, like, hey, i, I got to have my books. Okay, so do this. Meet me at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Hyatt Regency in Jerusalem is right on the dividing line between east and west. And so it's sort of like the meeting place between the two communities. I said, meet me at the Hyatt Regency. I'll, I'll come up there. We'll talk about it. So he drives down. I meet him at the Hyatt Regency. He pulls up big truck. I whip in there with my Fiat Uno, and I began to negotiate. And it was like, oh, no, you can't do this. It's just two minutes down the road. I'll be honest with you, it wasn't two minutes down the road. It was like ten minutes down the road. But I was trying to land the plane on the deal, okay? Don't judge me. And so I'm like, hey, you know, it's two minutes down the road. So I began to touch the side of my face like this. That means that if I'm lying to you, I will shave half of my mustache. Okay, and so I'm like, look, you're going to be safe. I promise you're going to be safe. I will ride with you in the truck. I will guarantee your safety. He's like, no, there's no way. So we're speaking in Arabic, Hebrew, and English, you know, as best we could communicate. And he's like, there's no way. It's too dangerous. I'm not doing that. I'm like, oh, no, you're killing me, bro. And I'm like, oh, and I'm like, I promise you're going to be okay. And I'm doing that. He wasn't buying it. So I began to touch my chin like this. If you know anything about uh, Middle Eastern culture, that means... If I'm lying to you, I will shave my beard. Now, fun fact, I didn't have a beard. But it's the meaning. 
behind it is, I, 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 pro- I promise you that you're going to be okay. And he still wasn't buying it. And he's like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And so I began to touch the top of my head, which means Adorosek. Adorosek in Arabic means it is upon my head. It's, it's like, it's like uh, where we say I promise to God or something like that. It's not a curse, but it's almost. And so I'm like, Adorosek, Adorosek. Basically, it means your safety is now upon my head, and I'm responsible for it. I promise you you're going to be okay. It's just two minutes down the road. Just two minutes, two minutes down the road, I promise. Two minutes, it was 10, but I'm trying to land the plane. So then I pull out, last stop is a bucksheesh. You know what a bucksheesh is? A bucksheesh is a bribe. However, a Sims of God world missions policy is that we don't pay bribes, so I hope nobody's live streaming this uh, for them to see that. If you are, my name is Tyler Harris. Uh, and so I pull out my wallet, and I've got some shekels in there, you know, and I'm like, dude, I'm going to make your day. It is it's going to be, you don't even believe in Christmas, but it's going to be Christmas, okay? And so I'm going to give you this, and I'm showing him shekels, and he's like, no, nah, no, nah. I'm like, oh, it's two minutes down the road, it's two minutes down the road. And this is what he says to me. He laughs out loud. Ha, ha, ha. Hell is two minutes away. And I stopped. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that man is right. Here's this lost Jewish gentleman. And I took that moment. I said, sir, you have no idea how right you are. Because hell is two minutes away for the unbeliever. And so I shared with him the good news, which, by the way, is illegal in Israel. It's against the law to preach the gospel, and but I did. I would love to be able to tell you this man had a glorious introduction to Jesus. He did not. Uh, I, he did deliver my books. I did pay the buck sheesh. School started on time. Everything was fine. But that moment left an indelible mark in my spirit. Because for us, for the church, for you, Hell is two minutes away for the unbeliever. Do you believe that today? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that hell is two minutes away for the lost and the undone? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, hell really is two minutes away. So I've got a message that I want to share with you today. Basically, the title of this is Now is the Time. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 13. Uh, And we're going to begin in verse 11. And do this. Paul says to the church in Rome, understanding the present time. And if you've got an ink and paper Bible, I just want you to underline. If you've got a digital device, I want you to highlight this. Understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing or in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. But rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul said this, understanding the present time or or knowing the time or since you know the time. I don't know about you, but I've had to turn the news off. My anxiety level peaks the minute I click on and start watching all the things that are happening in the world and, and specifically in the United States, all that stuff. Now, I've had the return of Jesus preached to me my entire life, but I am here to tell you today, Awakened Church, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Let me say that for the people in the back. Jesus is coming back. And if you believe that, and if you believe that hell is only two minutes away for the unbeliever, there is something that we must adopt in the way we operate our day-to-day lives to express the fact that we know those things are to be true, or that we know those things are true. We are not ignorant of the fact that time is our most precious commodity. You can't make more of it. You can't buy more of it. 
It is the most precious thing that we have. This was true in Paul's day and now much more true for us. Therefore, church, now is the time to pray harder and more frequently than ever. Now is the time to live as though Jesus it was to return before dark. Now is the time to tell the good news of the gospel to the unsaved, to serve the church, to serve God, and to serve our fellow man. Now is the time to give your talent and your treasure to please Jesus with your life. You know what's, what's interesting is that even though I'm a minister and Tyler's a minister and we have different expressions of how we do this, everybody in this room has the same calling on your life. Do you know that? Everybody in this room is called to please Jesus with your lives. Now, that may look differently for you in the marketplace, in the classroom, uh, in, in, in wherever God's called you. It looks different for me in a full-time vocational context, uh, dealing with the corporate side of the church. It, it looks different for Pastor Tyler, who's, who's in here slugging it out day to day, working in the community, standing in the pulpit, preaching Jesus. It looks different for us, but everybody in this room has the same calling, and that is to please Jesus with your lives. So I've got three quick points I want to bring to you today, and then I want to pray for you. If your relationship with God is not as, as it should be, you should be scared to death. The return of Jesus is so close. You can turn on the news, you can walk through downtown, and you can see that everything that is mentioned in the New Testament, pre uh, the precursor to the return of Jesus, seems to be playing out in our very midst. He says in the last days, right will be wrong, wrong will be right. And now look at the news. Now, now men can be women and women can be men. From our text, there are three things that Paul mentions that are we are commanded to take right now because we know the time is short. Point number one, it is time to get up. Look at verse 11. And do this understanding the present time, the hour has already come to you. Wake up from your slumber. Wake up, church. It is time to get up. The world has been spiritually lulled to sleep, with which results in the very problems that we are facing today. We are spiritually asleep when a mother can kill her own children with her bare hands. We are spiritually asleep when a man can so easily walk away from his family. We are spiritually asleep when a young person can walk into a school and mercilessly kill his classmates. There is something indicative about the society in which we live that indicates to us that the world has been lulled into sleep. And these are problems that will not be solved. I'm about to get up in somebody's Kool-Aid for just a second here. But if you don't like what I have to say this morning, I want you to email me at Tyler at Awaken Church. But these problems are not going to be solved by passing more laws or putting the right people in the White House of Congress. You say, now, Pastor John, I, I need to exercise my civic duties. Absolutely. You know, patriotism is a virtue. You need to do that. But that is not the end all. That's not going to solve our problems. It will require a work of the Spirit and an awakening for, from the church and those who follow Jesus from their sleep. Before we jump on the world too much, though, could it be that the church has allowed many of these things by being lulled into sleep themselves? We have churches now that are deader than the churches we came from. Now you're saying, oh, wait a minute, Pastor John. I, I mentioned earlier I've closed 11 churches, and, and I, all, all I did was the paperwork. They had already closed. But I will tell you this. Churches in America are not doing well. They're not growing. They're shrinking. And you see on a day-to-day -day basis, I wonder if the church has been lulled into a sleep, has allowed the, the enemy to lull us into sleep. We have churches that are now deader than the ones we came from. We have people who shout on Sunday and then go to the restaurant and treat the waitress disrespectfully. We have people that by Tuesday, <laughs> they are in church on Sunday, by Tuesday they've already blown up at their coworkers. Uh, we have uh, people who are in church on Sunday, and by Thursday they call the school and chew out the teacher before getting all the facts. There are people that come to our churches each week and go home still poisoned 
with bitterness and unforgiveness. We have people that gave more money last month for cable, TV, and internet than they put in the missions offering. I just got a well up here on the front row. Well, are y'all here with me this morning? I, I know first crowd, uh, first service said it was better. Can y'all, we're going to practice something just right. I'm going to just divide a line right down the side of the room. This room, when, when I say something good, I want you to shout, uh, praise the Lord. Would you do that for me? Just practice real quick. All right, we're at First Baptist. Let's try it again. All right. And then from this line over, I just want you, when I say something good, I want you to say, preach it, Brother John. Ready, go. Oh, there, all right. Favorite group right here. Now is the time for us to awaken out of our sleep because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And that salvation means the return of Jesus. Do we really believe that Jesus is coming? Do we really believe that hell is two minutes away from the unbeliever? If so, now is the time to awaken from our sleep. Jesus told a story of ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. The problem with the virgins was not terrible wickedness. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They didn't watch bad movies. They didn't listen to bad music. They were not in the nightclubs or the casinos. You saw them in church on Sunday. The problem was they simply missed the bridegroom because they did not remain awake long enough to prepare for his arrival. I believe the hand of God is once again upon the shoulder of the church trying to wake us up. And say, I'm coming, and I'm coming soon. Point number two. Point number one, get up. Point number two, get dressed. Look at verses 12 and 14. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Put on the armor of light. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Point number two, it's time to get dressed. Number one, we, we wake up, but it's time to get dressed. We are to put on certain things. It is one thing to get up, but when you wake up, you have to be determined to get something accomplished, and that requires getting dressed for work. I have got news for the millennials and the Zs in here. You cannot wear your pajamas to work. You can wear them to Walmart, but you can't wear them to work. SpongeBob SquarePants pajamas don't work in the marketplace. It is time to get dressed and do something for God. Paul tells us to put on the armor of light. But in order to do that, we have to first put off the works of darkness. Most of us, every morning, take off our bed clothes, our pajamas, and we put on our work clothes. I would look like a fool if I showed up at the district office tomorrow with my pajamas on. And certain jobs require certain attire. What if I was a fireman and I wore a suit to work? I would not be prepared. Now, see, usually when I'm preaching, I, I wear a sport coat and some slacks and a dress shirt, but thank the Lord for the Tyler Harris's of the world who allow me to dress like I want to dress. Actually, he, I, I'm not dressed like I want. If I could live my whole life in a T-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops, I would be happy. Can, can I get an amen? Thank you. I usually, I usually wear, you know, a little, little bit better than what I'm, I'm wearing now because you just don't know how people are going to perceive you. But if I get up tomorrow to go fishing, and I put on my sport coat and my slacks, that would be stupid. Paul understood that we were engaged in a spiritual battle, and so he instructs the Romans to put on the armor of light. We put on that armor of light in order to wage warfare in the darkness. Now, the armor of light does not fit properly, with the works of darkness, and therefore the works of darkness and sin must be cast off or removed. The devil, the enemy, tries to clothe us with sin and unrighteousness every day, so every day we must make a conscious decision to cast off darkness and to put on the armor of light. When our head pops off the pillow, we have a decision to make. 
We have a decision to make. Am I going to be a light in a dark place, or am I going to fit in? There's something so interesting about having three daughters. And, and by the way, I, parents, dads, they understand this. But, but having to clothe three girls plus a wife is an incredible task. And, um, uh, and I just thank the Lord that he's blessed me. I pay my tithes and I give offerings because I know I have to buy a pair of boots for every outfit for the females in my house. Y'all know, why do y'all have to do that? Why do you have to have a pair of shoes for every outfit? I don't understand. I was raised with one pair of shoes, a pair of shorts, and a camouflage T-shirt. And look at me, I turned out fine. I'm sorry, I think I was just venting there for a moment, just getting that off my chest. Thank you, I got to preach. <laughs> oh. But you know what's so interesting about them is that they are independent. Mind. They're strong females. They're independent. They're their own person, and I champion that. But you know what's funny is that everything in their closet looks just like everything else that everybody wears to their class. All the other girls wear the same clothes. Now, isn't that funny? I mean, it's like you want to be different. In it. The world should see something different about you in the marketplace. When you go to work, there should be something different about Susie. Man, listen, everybody's losing their mind, and she is calm, cool, and collected. We need to go and find out what's going on with her. When there's layoffs and, and, and closings and all this thing, she's sitting over there praising the Lord, and we're over here losing our minds. There's got to be something different between her and everybody else. There, there should be a difference between you, sir, when you go into your business and the way you operate your business on honesty and integrity is an incredible juxtaposition against everybody else who's out there trying to make a dollar. There's something different about us. We're not supposed to look like everybody else. Now, can I just say this? You don't have to be weird. All right? My high-value ethic in my friend groups is that you're normal. That means you love Jesus with every fiber of your being. You're fully Pentecostal, but you're not kooky. I'm allergic to kooky, all right? But you do and be and live and sound and look different than everybody else because they don't know what you know. You know Jesus. You know he's coming back. You know that you decided that morning to wake up and put on an armor of light that I am putting on Jesus Christ himself as I'm walking into my classroom, as I'm walking into my place of work, as I'm living in my home. I know that there's something different about me than everybody else in the world. And then verse 14, it says, put on Jesus. Imagine that. We put on Jesus. When I clothe myself with Christ, you don't see me, but you see the clothing that I am wearing. The same is true with the works of sin and darkness. There's a lot of people who put that on, and that's all the world sees. When I am clothed with Christ, the world does not match what I'm wearing. And I look like a fool trying to wear the works of darkness in Christ simultaneously. And you know what's interesting, and, and this is this is kind of uh, kind of funny, comical to me, but um, but I I listen to like uh, podcasts, and you know when I occasionally watch news, what Christians raging against the things that are happening in the world, people who are lost and undone, doing stuff that is against God and doesn't really make, make sense. And they're just angry about it. And you know what? I just scratch my head and I'm like, you know, that's kind of like what they're supposed to be doing, isn't it? That's why it's called the world. They're acting like right is wrong and wrong is right. And, and we're just angry about it. It's like, you know, really? I think they're supposed to be doing that. I think our job is to show them a different way. And so when we put on Christ, they see him and they don't see us. God is calling us not only to wake up, to get up, but to get our armor on and prepare for the battle. One thing I, I skipped over real quick and I want to back up to is some of the things that we struggle with as Christians. Uh, we go to church each week, but we leave still poisoned with the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the resentment that we walked in with that morning. I would say that unforgiveness has undone more Christians than we care to admit. Uh, I shared this in the earlier service, and I'm going to share it with you too, because I feel like there's somebody here who needs to hear this. 
I got saved at an early age, but um, I was not raised in a very good home. Uh, my father left when I was two. Uh, the last time I saw him as a child was when I was five. He came to the door of our house. I didn't recognize him. And I remember as a young man turning around to my mom and saying, Mama, there's a man at the door. I uh, didn't know who he was. Um, my mother had severe mental health issues, borderline personality disorder, uh, and uh, was not raised in a very good environment at all. As a matter of fact, my, my Pentecostal tongue-talking grandmother is the reason that I'm uh, saved and uh, in the pulpit today, and she was a, kept us in church and kept us at camps and, and those type things. Thank the Lord for praying grandmothers. And I carried that trauma uh, of that upbringing and abandonment all through my adult years. Uh, just went through many, many thousands of dollars worth of counseling. And by the way, I'm an advocate for counseling. Uh, it helped me process a great deal uh, in my life. But you know that the trauma and the scars that you uh, experience at an early age can, can follow you through life. And I had some of the common characteristics of that. Uh, and uh, and I, I knew it wasn't good. I loved Jesus, but I, I knew that there were some things that the Holy Spirit was still trying to work out in my, in my heart and in my life and help me through uh, those moments. And I carried a great deal of bitterness and unforgiveness uh, uh, in my life. And uh, Jennifer and I, I was, I was, uh, it was in two, the year 2000, we were home itinerating uh, for the mission field. We were getting ready to go back in August. Uh, we were ho uh, home raising some money. And... Uh, the Holy Spirit began to, to, to work on me about, um, about reaching out to my father. And I, I immediately identified that as the devil, you know. <laughs> like, oh, the devil's trying to trick me. Oh, no, I ain't doing that. I'm not playing that game. And he just continued to work on my heart, work on my heart. And said, you know what? You need to reach out to your father. I'm like, I'm not reaching out to this guy. He abandoned us when I was two years old. We were raised in abject poverty. Um, with a with a terrible situation, a stepfather was completely unengaged, and so no, I'm not I'm not going down that road because I know how that turns out. You guys know how that turns out. I've heard the stories, the horror stories. You reach out to somebody, like, who are you and what do you want? You know, I I don't I didn't need to add to my issue. Okay, I did not need to add to my issue. And so Lord, I I don't I trust you, but I don't understand you. And so I'm not okay with doing this. I, I, I don't know why you're pushing me to do it, but I, I'm not okay. And so in typical male fashion, ladies, you're going to learn about us today. In typical male fashion, I waited until the day before we left to go back to the Middle East to be obedient. You know what I'm talking about? Because, guys, we procrastinate. Till, but then we can leave town, you know what I'm saying? And we just immediately get on the plane and go. And so uh, we, uh, I think they call that avoidance. I don't know. I think it's called being a man. And so... Um, uh, you know, I'm like, Lord, I, I feel you doing this. I understand. Kids, you're going to be shocked. We had these things called phone books back in the day where I knew where he lived. I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about him. I knew the city that he lived in, and I knew his name, and that you could open up the phone book, and you could actually find somebody's phone number. Kids, you can go Google phone books so that you will understand that back when we had dinosaurs, we used phone books to find people. And... Um, uh, and so I knew, I knew his phone number, I knew where he lived, and I'm like, Lord, I'm not okay with this, but I will be obedient. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to be obedient because I know how this turns out. And I, certainly you're not going to lead me into something that's going to cause me even more trauma. So I talked to Jennifer about it. She's like, you know what, you need to be obedient. Don't know how it's going to turn out. It's probably going to be bad, but you just need to do what the Lord's asking you to do. And so I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so we're leaving to go back to the Middle East the next day. And I pick, pick up this phone book, and I call this number, and a lady answers the phone. I didn't know that my, my uh, father had remarried, so my stepmother was on the phone. And, uh, and I said, look, I, I don't know you. You don't know me. My name is John. I am the youngest child of Dave's uh, there, and I don't know why I'm calling. I just felt like I was supposed to. And so, you know, you're free to hang up. I don't need anything. I don't want anything from you, from him, I don't, I don't even know why I'm doing this, but I'm doing it. And she immediately burst into tears. And, and through her tears, she said, about two years ago, your father was delivered from drugs and alcohol in a church service at a Methodist church in South Georgia. And he had been praying for two years. 
didn't know and was embarrassed to reach out to any of the children um, and has been praying for two years that there would be some some element of reconciliation. And, uh, and so through that, God brought about a glorious uh, reconciliation. And so fast forward to 2023, we have a great relationship. He's apologized. And there's power in apology. You, you, by the way, you're, you're not always right. <laughs> and and, he, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a weighted apology. It was, hey, listen, I'm responsible for all of this, and it's my fault. And you didn't deserve it. Now, I know that that is the exception to the rule. Okay? I can tell you all the horror stories of people who have tried to reconcile and their attempts were rebuffed. I'm telling you what God was trying to do in John's life. Because the the bitterness and resentment that had continued to be a part of my life, God knew that I had to deal with that in order to fully wear the armor of light and to be able to put on the Spirit of Christ. And so even though I love Jesus, born again, spirit-filled, there were elements in my life. You guys understand sanctification. God's constantly trying to work you out of you. And so through this process, he was able to bring about a reconciliation and and it didn't immediately dissipate, but I will tell you, 23 years of processing and all these other things, I'm at a place now where I understood exactly what God was doing in order to bring me to the place that I needed to be right now. And so for you, church, awaken. there may be some issues, resentment, unforgiveness, some debilitating recurring sin that you can't seem to get over. There's something that that you may be dealing with that God is going to be saying to you today, I want to deal with this because time is short. You need to wake up and you need to get dressed and you need to be able to wear what I need you to wear. Point number three, getting up, getting dressed. Look at verse 13. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing uh, drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Let us behave. You know, that is an action statement. Let us behave. The third point is this. It's time to get going. Number one, we get up. Number two, we get dressed. And number three, we get going. It would be ridiculous for me to wake my family up every morning and have them get dressed only to sit down and do nothing. It is time for the church to get busy. It is not God's plan for his children to get up and get dressed unless they plan on going somewhere. Some people have allowed the Spirit to awaken them, but they have not gone far enough, and they've just enjoyed the emotional excitement of waking up. Now, I'm listen, I am prejudiced against morning people. You know who I'm talking about? I married one of those. Her head pops off the pillow. She's smiling. Birds are chirping. Butterflies are flapping. I don't even want to talk till my second cup of coffee because I'm half comatose. Morning people, well, I'm not sure we like you. We love you in the Lord, but we're not sure that we understand how you are wired. But can you imagine this? Your head's popping off the pillow. You're getting dressed. You're brushing your teeth. You're fixing your hair. You're looking good. And then you sit down and do absolutely nothing. Get your armor on. Put off the works of darkness. Go deeper in the things of God by consistent prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, witnessing, tithing, and serving. Others may have been awakened and you are now dressed. Now it is time for you to get going and get busy. Athletes train, practice, get their uniform on for a reason. They want to get in the game where the action is. When you get up and get your armor on, it is time to get in the game. There are Sunday school classes that need teachers. There are nursery workers, that, uh, nurseries that need workers. There's uh, worship teams that need singers. If you have not yet witnessed to that coworker or classmate, do it this week. If you have a neighbor that is in need, go serve them. Young person, if God is calling you into full-time ministry, don't wait until later for something to happen get involved now 
If a young person gets saved in church at 10 years old, they should already be a leader at 18. You're saying, no, wait a minute. They're the church of the future. No, they're not in church right now. At church right now, we wait until they, you know, they, until they get through youth and all these other things, and then the world start enticing them. You know what? You know, listen, young person, I'm going to tell you something. I got saved at 10 years old, and I lived for Jesus my whole life. The best testimony is not that God takes you off the street and puts a, a, a drug addict into the pulpit to preach. The best testimony is that you can find Jesus at 7, 8, 9 years old and live for Jesus your whole life. See, only Jesus can put a drug addict in the pulpit to preach, but only the power of the Holy Spirit can sustain a young person every day of their life. Get going as a child of the light. You're not made for the bars or dance floors. You're not created just to carry out lustful and immoral thoughts. Your life's purpose was not to carry a grudge or be contaminated by unforgiveness. We are children of the light. We are the children who wear the cloak of Christ upon our lives, and it is time for the church to awaken And get busy. Because Jesus is coming back. And hell is two minutes away from the unbeliever. Let me ask Pastor Tyler if you would. I'm going to land the plane on this. I know we're running a little late this morning. I want to ask you to do something with me. If you would all stand across the building.